Hello and welcome to my tabletop product photography fresh course. Now that's a mouthful. I'll be covering quite a lot in these next few minutes, so feel free to pause, rewind and fast forward as much as you need to. I'm using three studio lights and we have natural daylight coming from the window at the other end of the room. You can buy tabletop studio lights at a reasonable price. You can also use standard household lights. They will provide a different coloured light in your photos. But one thing to remember is always avoid shooting directly into the light as this will create silhouettes. Before I begin taking the photograph, I plan the shoot. This will cover the subject of the photo, the theme I'd like to capture, and what objects would also support this theme, including the backdrops, such as a fabric backdrop, or maybe even a glossy backdrop. Even after planning, you will still find that some objects that you think will work, won't work. They just don't suit the aesthetic, they don't suit the theme. Back to lighting. Cold light has a blue tone. Think moonlight, the computer screens. It's more suitable for protecting white tones. Warm light, such as the household lights, candles and sunlight, they tend to create this orange cast, which is perfect for enriching darker tones and golden objects. But the most dynamic type of lighting is a mix of both cold and warm light, with one of those being the most dominant. This tea themed photo took around 30 minutes. Frequently I was checking the composition of the image through the viewfinder and making adjustments as I went through. Businesses thrive on upselling and cross promotions. That's the benefit to this image. You've got the teapot, the cup, tea strainer, tea infuser, loose tea and a jar with a spoon. That's six items, not even including flowers. got the photo now we need to edit it especially if we've got a very dominant colored light like we have in this image firstly the most important step when editing any image is always duplicate your image layer for two reasons one it's great for comparison you can really truly see if you've taken the edit too far and second if you've over edited you can always go back to the original one and rework it. There's a few ways you can edit the colour. Using levels, in which case go to image adjustments and then levels, or you can press control or command plus L, depending on the operating system. You can use the eyedropper tools, which I've shown first, to catch the highlights, shadows or midtones. This isn't always going to give you the best result. To get the most control though over the tones, use the sliders underneath the graph. And for the best results, modify the channel and edit each one individually. Next we're going to be using curves. This is a great way to colour correct and increase the contrast. It can be used in conjunction with levels and acts much the same. By using both levels and curves, we're creating a more realistic image. Again, we're going to modify each channel individually because of the greater control this gives us over the final result. I do not suggest using presets for white balances. Even though the studio lights are static and nothing changes, your natural light source does. As the clouds move and as the time throughout the day changes, it will change the colour and the tonality of your photograph.
Depending upon your preferences, you could opt for a more washed out look or for a more vibrant look. And you can edit these really easily by going again to the menu bar at the very top, clicking image, adjustments, and then clicking on the vibrance. And then adjusting these to your own preferences. Gradual changes to these images are more realistic than the dramatic ones. So remember to try and keep it as subtle as possible. You can always add more later. The colours now, they're less yellow. Using levels and curves now would remove more details. So instead, we're now going to use colour balance or control and B or you can go to image adjustments and find color balance. Now again, we've moved these sliders depending on our preferences and which tone balance we'd like to affect. When working on the color balance, it's always important to preserve the luminosity. It makes for a much more realistic image. I work backwards using levels and curves because they affect the shadows and highlights and I want to be sure that I've removed that colour cast and it shows up more in the highlights and shadows than anywhere else in the image. So by using the colour balance as the last step on correcting the colour, I can be sure that that colour cast is gone. Editing images is not an exact science. And by fixing one thing, there tends to normally be something else that just needs to be tweaked slightly. And so for this fix, we're going to just edit the exposure. Now for this, again, we're going to the menu bar, image, adjustments, and exposure. And again, we're moving the sliders to our preferences. And now we save our work. Simply go into File and Save As. The first copy should always be the Photoshop format. This means your edits remain editable. And now for the web version. I've missed an important step here. We're going to go to File, Export and Export As. Here's where you'll see why I've made this important mistake. Currently, you'll see that the file is 9.3 megabytes in size. It says it's full quality right now. We drop it down to 5% quality and it's still at 334.2 kilobytes. Though the image is going to look awful. And it's definitely still not in the web-friendly zone and it would not represent the quality of your work or your product in any way. Still, as this is open, I'll save a full quality JPEG version and title it as such. Time to reduce this image using the clock tool. We have control over the size of the image we want. Now you can hover over the icons at the side and it will tell you which tool you're using. And as a standard, because I use this crop tool so often, mine automatically sets itself to 950 px wide. And with the simple press of the enter button, and we see a 3x3 grid. And we click on the little tick to confirm this change. That looks small. Now it's a web friendly sized image. So let's export it. Again, go to File, Export and Export As. You'll still see that at full quality, this image is 449.5 kilobytes. So it's still too big to put online, but we can reduce the quality. We're looking roughly for an image around 125 kilobytes to 200 kilobytes, but we can get away with using 250. The smaller, 
the better, but we still need to maintain a certain level of quality. And don't forget to title your image, ideally with something a little bit more search engine friendly than the title I've used. And it's all ready for you to upload to your website along with all of the descriptive text that needs to go with it. Thank you for listening and for watching. 